Well, welcome back to the fourth passage in our God Is series. Today we're seeing that God is gracious. We've looked at God's greatness, God's glory, God's goodness. But for us as God's people, the best news in the world is that God is gracious. And this is a wonderful passage that shows us that. So I just encourage you, if you haven't done so yet, then pause the video. Take a few moments just to read through the passage a few times for yourself. Try and notice the flow of Paul's argument here and highlight key repeated ideas, things that stand out for you. Uh, put question marks through the text where you perhaps have um, things that you're unsure of. Spend some time praying that God would open your eyes to see wonderful things about Him and what it means to belong to Him from His Word. And then I'm going to go through and show you, as always, um, some of what I've noticed in this passage. When Paul writes, he's generally got a very clear flow of thought and you can see it in this passage. He starts with this as for you, um, focusing that he's speaking to the Ephesians themselves, but he is going to also include everyone, all of us, in his argument. Um, and he's laying out a thought, but then he gives us these transition words. In this case, verse 4, but, flowing to a, a new idea, and then for in verse 8 and verse 10, just showing that his, his argument has a flow. And verses 1 to 3, Paul is painting the bad news for us. And then uh, verse 4 through to verse 7, Paul is showing that something has changed. And then the results of that change. Let's go through and just note some of the key repetition. So in the first section, as for you, you were dead. He brings that up. When we were dead in the next section. And what caused us to be dead? Well, it was because of our transgressions and sins. which he mentions again later, our transgressions that have caused us to be among those who are dead. In this first section, Paul speaks about uh, the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Uh, this is talking about uh, Satan, the devil. He is the one who is ruling this world. And in the first section, you see Paul uses these phrases, you followed, you lived, you gratified, again, you were following. And the things that um, were being followed are the world, the ruler of the kingdom of the world, and the flesh. This is what some people would sometimes call the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, people are naturally following or uh, wanting to gratify the cravings of their flesh, following their own desires and thoughts. And what Paul is doing in verse 1 to 3 is he is setting up this awful picture that all of us are by nature, uses this phrase, by nature, dead. By nature, deserving of wrath or children of wrath. It is an awful picture that Paul paints for us here, but it's something that we need to take on board, particularly in our world where people don't like to admit that they're wrong, when most people say, oh, I am by nature good, sometimes I do bad things, but I am intrinsically good. Paul is showing here that actually, by nature, we are Dead. And when Paul says here dead, he means dead, having no life, absolutely spiritually dead. And that's the way that we enter the world. By nature, we are those who are transgressors. Uh, this trespasses is violations of God's commands. And those are the things that we do by nature. And then sins 
are offenses against God in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. And that is who we are by nature. We are deserving of wrath because of the way that we live. And Paul is very clear using these words, so following and gratifying. He's showing that that's how we're wired. We want to fulfill these longings in our hearts, these desires and thoughts, and so we follow after them. But as good as it might feel, or as good as the world thinks it is, it's actually showing that we are these dead men walking. We are deserving of wrath. And if nothing happens, that's where all people on the planet are heading. They're going to face the good and gracious and glorious and great God. They're going to face him. But if they haven't been saved by him, they're going to face him as the God of wrath. And his wrath is right. But thankfully, that's not where the passage ends. And in verse 4, there's this big transition. Um, actually, in the Greek, uh, two words are following each other. They say, but God. So, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, has made us alive with Christ. And those that little phrase, uh, but God, is in many ways, the greatest short phrase in the history of human speech. But God has done something. Even when we were dead, God has done something. Because of his great love. And you see the focus here is on God. It's because of his great love. It's because of his rich mercy. He is the one who has made us alive. And he's done that. We we're made alive with Christ. And if we just go through here, we see God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him. All this has happened in Christ Jesus. His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We were created in Christ Jesus. So the big focus here is that all of this that happens, happens because of Christ, because of Christ's work in our lives. That even though we who were dead in our transgressions can now be saved, and it is by grace. God in his grace has done something. It is by grace that you have been saved. One thing that Paul is known for, particularly in Ephesians, but elsewhere, is sometimes he just gets carried away and his sentences become really long. And actually verse 1 to 7 is one long sentence in the original Greek. And the, the main verbs in the sentence are uh, raised us up and seated us. And what this shows in the beginning section is even though we were dead in our sins, because of God's great love, rich mercy, and by his grace, we've been saved. And this results in us being raised up and seated. These are present um, realities for us. Just as God raised Jesus from the dead, that same power that God exerted to do that, he has raised us up with him. That is a present reality. And God has seated us with him in the heavenly realms. This is a present reality. It is as good as though we were there already. And in the coming ages, God is going to show the incomparable riches of his grace. For all eternity... We are going to be on display as God's objects of grace, his trophies of grace. As we work our way through a passage like this, it should just remind us again that all of us, we're all a part of this. All of us are deserving of wrath because of our rebellion against God. But God has done something, something absolutely amazing, something that shows his love and his mercy. He has, by his grace, saved us. He's raised us up. We're seated with him. We get to rejoice in his incomparable riches. 
and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then if you're looking for a summary of the gospel, the gospel in a nutshell, here you've got it in verse 8 and 9. If anybody asks you what is the gospel, you could just read them these two verses. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is an important point just to note down here. The this, what is the this referring back to? Is it referring back to the grace? Is it referring back to the faith? Is it referring back to the salvation? Digging into the Greek, you can see the, um, the form of the words helps us here. And it points to the fact that the this here is actually referring to the whole act of salvation. It is the grace, the salvation, and the faith that are all a gift from God. God does it all, so he gets the glory. Uh, sometimes people will think about, we take this first step of faith and God does all the rest. Actually, no, the faith itself is a gift from him. We contribute absolutely nothing to our salvation. The only thing we contribute is our sin and deadness. And a dead person can't raise themselves. A dead person can do nothing. And so God does it all, all because of his grace. He saves us. He gives us faith. And all of this profoundly impacts the way that we live. So this is sometimes missed, the flow of the argument in some, some of our translations, including the NIV here. But this word live um, is the Greek word peripateo, which is to walk. In which you used to walk. And that same word, peripateo, is translated here, do. Um, that God prepared them in advance, that we should walk in them. So, looking out in a text for repeated ideas, this is a very important one. We used to walk in our transgressions and sins, but not anymore. We can't just carry on living like that. And some people will argue that, well, God is rich in grace, so we can just carry on living the way we want to. Paul doesn't allow us to do that. He says, actually, now we need to walk a new way. We need to walk in the good works, which God has prepared for us to walk in. Paul has labored hard to show that it's not our good works that save us. God has done everything necessary to save us. So it's not by works, but we are created for we are saved for good works. And the works that we do are not to earn God's favor, but rather they are works because we already have God's favor. Martin Luther once said that justification is by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. What he meant by that is once you've been saved, there are good works for us to do. And as we dig in further into this, we should be thinking, I am a trophy of God's grace. As I look in the mirror, I can see God's grace at work in me. He has lavished his love on me and he's shown me his mercy and his kindness and the incomparable riches of his grace. And now I should be an instrument of grace in the lives of others. There are good works that God has prepared for me to do. And should, we should be praying and saying, God, please help me to see how you want to use me in response to the incredible work of grace that you have done in me. So as you dig in further, I pray that God would stir your heart, excite your heart with this glorious news that he is gracious and that it would um, equip you to be somebody who's living for him. And as you teach others that his grace would excite them to be living for him too. Oh, God bless as you dig in further.